we're good to go. Fabulous. Um, well, as, as John outlined to you, I'm sure sort of the, the um, general idea behind this interview was to, yeah, really, really to get some of your insights on well-being and particularly um, what Aboriginal culture can communicate yep. um, to us about that. Um, yeah, so, so perhaps you could just sort of dive in and, and just really briefly introduce yourself first. In what way? I mean, the word legend kind of captures it all, really. <laughs> um, what, uh, just a sentence or two um, about sort of what you, what you do. I mean, that bit might be something I can quite easily sort of pick, pick up off the web, website um, as well. But just uh, Yeah, it's not easy to capture me that way, but I'll, I'll give you a praise of, of who I am and where I've come from. Yep. And then you might be able to drag out what it is that you think is relevant for uh, for the target audience. So mm, perfect. Uh, these days, my name is Paul Kelligan, and I know you're going to turn this into a narrative, but um, I know you're recording as well. So Paul Kelligan, I am a I am a Waramai Aboriginal man, and that's a really interesting thing to say these days because when I grew up, when I was young, you were known as an Aboriginal person, and that was the label because that was the level of, of sophistication of Australia and also knowledge at the time. And then about 20 years ago, I would have called myself a Koori as opposed to a Guri or a Murray, which are different parts of Australia. And then probably 10, 15 years ago, I started to express myself as a Waramai person, which is the nation I'm from, which is Port Stephens. And then in more recent years, I am able to say that I'm a Gamapingal man, which is my clan, which is the Karul River. And even more recently, I could say that really I'm part of a larger group called the Gadung Language Group. So in fact, what I really am is Paul Callaghan, Gamapingal clan, my Nation of the Gadung speaking group of peoples of the mid-north coast of New South Wales, which is an insight into the rebirth of Aboriginal culture and the renewal of Aboriginal culture in the East Coast of Australia, which is a particularly wonderful thing to be part of because my mother's era was still under the, the really horrific policies of segregation and mission management and cultural genocide, whereby she knows none of, very few of these kinds of things. She's, she's known culture in a lived way, but it's not something that she would have been given in a recognised way. So she. She expresses culture through her behaviours, but really wouldn't think that she's very cultural because of the shutdown of, of culture for Aboriginal people since, since the first fleet in 1788. So I'm a Waramai man, I'm 60 years of age. So I'm quite old for an Aboriginal man really, because our average age is about 68 from memory. So we die very young compared to non-Aboriginal Australians. I, these days, am primarily an author on well-being. My vision is to share with the world the beauty of Aboriginal culture and how this traditional wisdom is not only applicable and has sustained Aboriginal well-being for 100,000 years, it's even more applicable in the Western world and it's there for all people to embrace and consider should they choose to, and it's not meant to be a, a logarithm or a, an algorithm or a prescriptive one only approach to well-being. It's meant to sit there as a, as a bucket of knowledge to tap into and harvest for, to, to take what suits in terms of wisdom for individual well-being, to sit beside other universal wisdoms such as Christianity, Hinduism, Buddhism, North American, Native American wisdom and all the other kinds of things that are out there for people to partake in. So what I write is to sit beside that. I've written a book called Iridescence mm. that's already published. I'm currently writing a book with a working title called Whispers of the Ancients that has a, a different structure but similar messaging. I've also completed two novels, one's called Coincidence and one's called Consequence. And they're sitting, uh, waiting in a, in a, in a lineup, if you like, for me to 
complete this book and then I'll bring those forth. And that second book called Consequence is part of a PhD that I've just about completed. And the PhD is the novel itself, but also a thesis that identifies why I'm writing novels. And in, in one way, it's again a capture of what I'm about. And the reason I write novels are uh, twofold. One, it's one target audience is for Aboriginal people so that our mob learn about our culture because for many of us it was taken away, but also feel good about our culture and are able to embrace that culture to help build the identity that's been stolen from us. And just as important, the second reason I write these novels is to provide a learning tool for non-Aboriginal people to learn about the beauty of our culture, break the stereotypes, live better lives and also generate better relationships between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Australia. So that's what I do these days, but it comes from a place where I have been a CEO, I have been an executive. So I was once uh, an executive, a CEO in TAFE, where I had a $60 million budget with 1,200 staff and 23,000 students across 11 campuses. I've got a degree in accounting. I've got a diploma in surveying, a diploma in drafting, and postgraduate studies in executive coaching, executive leadership, and governance. That's me. Wow. <laughs> yeah. What what um what an incredible, incredibly sort of um diverse background of skills you must have picked up along the way there. It is, it is. And and really I what I see myself is is a walker of many worlds and what I try and do is is show to people how these different worlds can come together and give us this knowledge base that's individualised and customised, but has universal truths, so that each one of us can tailor the messaging and the knowledge and benefit from all the beauties that are around us. For instance, the, the Western world, the Western world in, the, in terms of its medical system isn't that good in terms of preventative health, which is the stuff I'm working on, but it's, it's excellent in terms of responsive care when there is a, a life-threatening or a, a major trauma. For instance, my son who just gave me the coffee he almost amputated his hand with a, in a sore accident in front of me two years ago and it was quite traumatic and we got him into the hospital and he still has his hand that was only hanging off by a bit of skin, he'd severed tendons and bones. But it was a miracle. Mm -hmm. So in the work I do, I never denounce the Western world, but I do say we need to challenge some of the premises of the Western world and we need to ask ourselves why, what do we believe in and why? and the things that we do, why do we do them and for what benefit? And so there are lots of great things in this contemporary world, such as such as the motor car and transportation and communication. But there are also many, many things that can take away from our well-being in the Western world. And that's where we can learn from the traditional wisdom because it, the traditional wisdom has lenses that we can use in all sorts of contexts and circumstances. Mm. and contemplate and reflect and make it our, not our, just, it can, it can relate to individual truths and, and how you live, but it also provides a lot of lensing to do with community and global perspectives, which is the book I've just about, well, the book I've finished the first draft of called Whispers of the Ancients. Mm. It that talks about individual well-being, but it brings it also back to, to global community and what do we need to do in terms of climate change? How can we be far more constructive in the way we debate and look at what we need to do in, in those kinds of paradigms? Mm. Beautiful. That leads me um, really nicely to, to the first question that I wanted um, yep. to ask you today, which is what can connection to country um, and other, uh, other Aboriginal values and perspectives teach us about crisis? and um, about crisis. yeah about yep. crisis and dealing with all of these multiple pressures on our well-being yep. yeah 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 to understand the concept of country from an aboriginal perspective one needs to understand the importance of, of what is called in english dream time stories and the term itself dream time story is problematic because it gives a a sense of something that's fairy tale and, and, and dreamy and not real. But for Aboriginal people, our dream time stories are our equivalent of a library and our knowledge system, as well as, a, as, as the Ten Commandments and the guide for us spiritually. 
because with Aboriginal people, mind, body and spirit aren't segregated, they are integrated. Mm. Everything is mixed together and they aren't meant to be pulled apart. So part of the importance of understanding country is understanding that in creation, there's a big creation story. And in that creation story, the, the earth was under the water and the planet earth was actually covered by water. And in the creation story, the waters broke and the mother was born. And so she rose above the, the earth and she was glorious when she rose above the earth. And then up in the sky, our other significant spiritual entity is our father. And our father saw the mother being born and thought, I've never seen anything so beautiful. I've got to go and meet whatever that is because it's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in the universe. And so the father came down and spent time with the mother and he fell in love with her and she fell in love with him. But he had to go back into the skies because he had responsibilities for far greater things than just his love. And that's a, that's a story within itself about we all have responsibilities. But he went back up in the sky, but because of their love, she became pregnant and she gave birth. And when she gave birth, she gave birth to all things. So plants, trees, dolphins, fish, insects. She gave birth to all those things. And lastly, she gave birth to humans. And so if all things come from the one mother, we're all family and we're all brothers and sisters. So the essence of country is the country is our mother and everything on country is family. And so whenever we walk country, we're actually walking with our family. And the feeling we get of comfort, love and nurture when we're with our family is the same as when we walk country. And so country is us being with family and the Western world takes us away from family because it locks us up and disconnects us from all that is around us in terms of nature. And so when we walk country, we connect with country, we're back with family, and that's why we have a sense of peace, but also a sense of well-being, because country heals us. And the thing about country is the country's always been there since that creation story, and the country's patient. And in our way, the mother loves us, because in our way, we are conceived in love, and we're born in love, and we, we die and go back into love, and we're surrounded by love in everything we do, and the mother loves us. And so in our way, if we love our mother, the mother earth, if we sing for our mother, if we hold ceremony for our mother, if we dance for our mother, if we care for our mother, if we learn about our mother, if we do all those things for the mother, the mother will always give us what we need, always. And that's, mm -hmm. that's similar to an unborn baby in the mother's belly. That unborn baby never has to worry about a thing because the biological mother will always care for that embryo. And that's the same thing for the earth. If we care for the earth, she'll always give to us. And so with all these crises, what we need to do is remember to listen to the lessons from the mother and also our brothers and sisters. So in our way, the greatest teachers are the birds and the animals and nature. And if we go and sit still in the bush, that's when we'll get our greatest learning. Because the reason we were born last was to remind us to never place ourselves above nature because our brothers and sisters are older than us and they love us as older brothers and sisters and they'll always teach us and guide us if we don't place ourselves above nature and are willing to sit and listen. So with these crises, it's about learning and it's about looking, listening and learning and being still. And so over 100,000 years, Aboriginal people have been through droughts, they've been through bushfires, they've been through epidemics, not so much pandemics, but they've been through epidemics. Everything you can think of, Aboriginal people have been through, but when they go through it, they listen and they look and they learn and then they pass that knowledge on in a loving way and it ties into spirit and it ties into country. So learning is a part of our spirituality and the old people say, if you come to me knowing nothing, if you come to me knowing everything, I can give you nothing. But if you come to me knowing nothing, I can give you everything. So when we go bush and when we sit with elders, we're meant to be empty empty cups and then we will be filled with knowledge and that's listening to the earth and when crisis happens rather than seeing it as a crisis what we do is go okay this is a challenge we'll get through it and then we'll learn from that and then we'll share that learning so that when it happens again the next generation will have the skills and be ready for it and read the signs and know when it's coming and know how to to manage that so our old people would know when an earthquake was coming they'd know when a cyclone was coming 
they burnt the land so there'd be no bushfires or only soft fires that never killed the animals. They would know when all sorts of things were coming because they would read the land, but also spiritually they would pick up the signs from the old spirit ancestors. And the spirit ancestors are our third entity. So in, in Christianity, you have the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. In our way, we have the Father, the Mother and the spirit ancestors. Mm. And that's who we listen to and that's who guide us in everything we do. And that's the connection and that's so, in essence, how do we deal with crises such as we're seeing today in terms of global warming and or pandemics? It's, it's listening to the earth and the messages of the earth, including our brothers and sisters, and also listening to the learning of our ancestors who passed on knowledge to tell us these things. Mm, absolutely. And... <laughs> I can see you sitting there thinking, oh, that's a lot to think about. No, it, it, it certainly is. Well, it, you've explained it in a really, um, in a beautiful way that makes so much sense. Thank um, you. Mm. Because our stuff is sense. Aboriginal culture, above all things, is inherently wise, but inherently sensible. And that's how the old, it's not my knowledge, it's what the old people have given me. And the way they explain it, you look at it and go, that, that just makes sense. For instance, in terms of healing, when we go bush, we heal because we're with family. That makes a lot of sense. But also with healing, why bush is so important is 80% of our to 90% of our body is water. So when we're sick, our spirit gets sick. And then because our spirit gets sick, our water gets sick in our body. So when we're sick, we need to go bush and we also need to go into the water and cleanse ourselves so that our waters can heal. And when our water heals and our spirit heals, then our body heals. And that's by going back into country and doing that. Mm. So we've always got to maintain that connection to country to maintain our, our strength of spirit. And that will maintain our wellness. And when we get unwell, it's because we've disconnected from country. And we're not eating the right things that country give us. We're starting to process things. We're starting to produce things. We're also getting stressed because we're taking on board things that aren't really part of what we call our LLRE law, our law, which is our way of life, our knowledge system and our value systems. And the law in essence says, I must always care for my place and all things in my place. So the cornerstone of Aboriginal spirituality is I must care for my place and all things in my place. And if you care for your place and all things in your place, your place will always give you what you need and all things around you will be there for the next generation. But in this Western world, rather than listen to nature and the important word is flow, rather than flow with nature and harvest what is around us. So we weren't nomadic primitive stone age wanderers like people paint us out to be. We were harvesters of the land that listened to the heartbeat of the land and the land told us where to go to get what food at what time of year. And we never stayed in one place because if you do, you kill everything in that one place. Plus you take all the firewood from that one place. Mm. So you move so you can maintain strong and healthy ecosystems. You move so that you can harvest what's given to you and you maintain your population so that you never ever overpopulate that area so that there's always plenty for future generations. And that's how we care for our place and all things in our place. And so the species were maintained over hundreds of thousands of years because we cared for country and we had stories about each animal and we had ceremonies for each animal and plant and we knew all about each animal and plant because that was our learning mechanism through story. Mm. And you've, you've touched on, I think, part of the reason already when you, um, when you talk about how disconnected we are as we live, um, in yep. the Western world, and that's disconnected from nature, clearly, most of us, and also disconnected from from our yep. um, our blood family as well. In many cases, we kind yep. of isolate yep. ourselves in the way that we live. Um, where yep. where do you see people kind of coming unstuck or or sort of like messing it up, getting a little bit wrong, if you like, when dealing with crisis in the Western world? Oh, uh, when dealing with crisis, well, mm. there's a couple of different things. There, there's the crisis itself, which is in the present moment. But but in a lot of in a lot of ways, people are always in a mental crisis because they're always going backwards and forwards in their mind. They're very rarely in the present to start with. Mm. So they're looking at the past with regret and anxiety and guilt, and then they're they're shifting the past into the future, saying, "Well, my life's been shit. It's going to be shit in the future." 
So when they look at the past, rather than use the past as a mechanism of learning and say, "What can I learn from the past?" and I'll embrace my past and I'll and I'll I'll feel I'll feel strong about my story and I won't feel bad about myself because I've always done my best. Quite often, people allow their self-esteem to be eroded and they allow their optimism to be eroded from the past, but then they project it to the future and they become anxious because. They go, well, the future is not going to be too good because we've got a crisis and I don't know if I've got money and I could lose my job and it's not looking really good. But really, we don't have a future because it's, it doesn't exist. In Aboriginal ways of being, time doesn't isn't a real thing. Past, present and future are all one. And in, in a sense, our place of well-being is in the now. And our well-being is in, is in the journey, not the destination because the destination is who knows what. We don't know where that sits. We don't know what lays ahead. So it's about being, and it's about harvesting the present, and, and I call it harvesting those magical moments. And John knows a thing I've, I've shared with him called the 10 out of 10 exercise, where you harvest 10 out of 10s, the good things that have happened in each day. And they're, they're quite often things that other people don't notice, such as a, I was walking an hour ago and smelled this beautiful rose garden because I do those things. Well, right now I'm, I can see the beauty of the clouds in the sky, you know. So partly the reason we respond badly to crisis is we've already programmed ourselves in a negative way because of our past and our fears of the future, but also the mind itself is wired to be negative because the brain is conducive to what's called a negative bias because watching out for danger means that we can handle anything that threatens our lives. And so the brain itself is wired for danger. And so it will respond to danger far more quickly than positives and it will remember danger and negative things far more than positives. So this negative bias. So you bring the negative bias plus our lived experiences of past and future. The brain itself is wired to, to not necessarily cope with the crisis that well. And then we have a tendency in the Western world to waffleize things. So when something is going bad, rather than just say, oh, okay, what will I do about this? We go, oh, this is awful. Why is this happening to me? So we tend to awfulize and then we tend to catastrophize rather than saying, here it is. Because Aboriginal people traditionally never catastrophized or awfulized. If there was a drought, they'd say, there's a drought. What will I do about it? If they chased a kangaroo and it got away, they'd say, okay, that's gone. What will I do now? And so it was always in a pragmatic way, what will I do about the circumstance before me? So you'll find if you don't awfulize, if you don't catastrophize, then you've got an ability to look at a crisis and say, what will I do to manage through this crisis? And that doesn't glorify a crisis. Crisis is a very, very tough. I, I've had several crises in my life and I do a talk about how I, I use them as a learning mechanism. So I had a crisis when I was 35 when I had a nervous breakdown to the point that was so substantial with the anxiety and and depression that I nearly killed myself. Uh, in more recent years, I had a crisis when my youngest brother died of lung cancer. I had another crisis a couple of years ago where my youngest son almost severed his hand. I had another crisis last year where my mother was with me on the tractor and between us we managed to cut a thumb off. I had another crisis where my career in the public service after 17 years was ended within 24 hours and I was no longer employed or employable. So in all those different instances, they weren't nice and I wouldn't wish them anybody, but I used them as a leverage point to say, what do I need to get through this crisis? Which comes back to my internal ways of thinking and finding the positives, but also allowing myself to be vulnerable, allowing myself to grieve, allowing myself to feel upset, tapping into friends, tapping into psychologists and all those things. And then working my way through it without looking to the future, trying to get rid of it, more so enjoying, more so embracing every moment and mm. working away with no intention of trying to be anything other than in the present and trusting in everything I believed in that eventually I'd get through the crisis, learn from it, and it would enable me to fulfill my destiny, which in our way we call our dreaming. Our dreaming is our destiny, our, our footsteps that we come on earth to, to fulfill, and it's about having faith in that, which is about a spirit, having a spiritual belief in something bigger than yourself, whether it be Christianity or Hinduism or Aboriginal spirituality. It's about believing that there is something bigger than us and we do have a purpose and that these things that happen aren't great, but, but they're for a reason and I'll harvest it rather than, than awful eyes around it. Mm. That, um, that brings us beautifully to the next question, which is 
are, are there stories or sayings from the old people that you find particularly powerful in shifting people's perspectives when it comes to taking care of well-being of their own well-being so you've spoken a lot about that that predisposition towards the negative negative bias and um yeah yeah are there stories stories or sayings from the old people that that you find oh, really yeah, help yeah, us to kind of just make that shift numerous. i mean Mm. It's about it's about using our words to explain some of the ways our old people th think. So, mm. our connection to country means we're never alone. In terms of of our spirituality, we come from the spirit pool. We come from a place where we're conceived in love. We're born in love. We're surrounded with love, and the center stone of our life is to always be loving, to love ourselves, and to love others. Um, our cornerstone of values is to always be. The neuron part, which I just told you about, that's N G U R R A M P A. Neuron part is the way to explain our law, which is I care for my place and all things in my place. So if you live a life where we care for all things, that creates this beautiful network where we care and we share. And so we've always got nurture. We're never alone. We're never isolated. That doesn't mean we're invading each other's space. There's always plenty of space for yourself. But if I care for my place and all things in my place, I'll always have food, I'll always have shelter, I'll always have a house over my head. There are always bush medicines around me. So that then ties into, if I come to you knowing everything, I can learn nothing. If I come to you knowing nothing, I can learn everything. So that's learning about your bush medicines. It's learning about where the food is. It's learning about being loving and respectful and humble at all times. It's learning to feel good about yourself and knowing that if I go bush, I know enough to stay alive and I know the bush will always take care of me. It's learning about living in the present and knowing that there's no need to panic. It's believing that no matter what happens, that eventually you'll go back to the spirit pool and you'll be in love. And it's believing that we've been here for thousands of generations and we're all part of everything. Because when our body goes to the earth, it, it, the waters go back into the earth and the waters then go up into the sky and then they rain on everything. And so we become part of everything. So it's, it's about believing. It's about trusting. It's about practical things, about how to know how to light a fire. It's knowing where the food is at certain times. And in a Western world perspective, it's about trying to understand that the Western world has a tendency to isolate. So we go back, we go into our houses and we lock the doors and they become these places of isolation and safety and anti-community. Whereas the traditional Aboriginal way is everything is about unity and community. So our housing enabled us to see each other, to talk to each other. We never held on to material things because we had no need for them. We shared everything. Whereas now we lock ourselves away because we don't want to lose material things. And so Western world, if you look at the research, it's primary focus on feeling good about yourself is about, it's about gathering material things and it's about power for most people. For Aboriginal people, our cornerstone of well-being is about establishing nurturing and beautiful relationships. So with Aboriginal people, our cornerstone of well-being is our relationships with each other, but also our relationships with the animals and the land. That's our, that's our benchmark of, of how we, if we think we're living a good life. But in the Western world, it's quite a dangerous thing and about material and, and it's also future focused. And it, if you look at the Western world, it's a very dangerous world because it's always talking about how we need to be in competition. So at school, you're competing with each other for marks, and then you go into what's called the capitalist market, which is the competitive market where to succeed as a business, you need to create a competitive advantage, which is a form of battle. To get a job, you need to go to a competitive merit selection based process, which again is stressful and it's all about fighting and battle. And everything about the Western world is we much battle each other, where in the, whereas in the Aboriginal world, everything is about sharing and nurturing and supporting each other. And so what we need to be looking at is, OK, we, we have got a, I, I used to lecture in economics, and so I understand supply and demand and market theory, and I understand how and why it works. But we need to temper that in terms of making sure that we do share, that we do care, and we do embrace these philosophies. That means that we can bring everyone up together in a place of well-being where we do have those basic essentials such as safety, such as a house, such as food, so no one struggles. Mm, that's, um, yeah, so it's such a, when you say it, it's such a, a simple thing, 
and yet as you say just so <laughs> so much in conflict with the way we're taught right from school age to approach things yeah that's wrong in my novel i've got all this in there so that it can be consumed in a way where younger readers can read it rather than think they're being lectured to and that's where I made the observation about this whole competitive thing. Everything in the Western world is a battle. I mean, even right now, when you look at what China is doing to Australia in terms of the barley market, saying we're going to put a tariff on, why should that cripple so many people? It's because we relied on this global trading scenario where we trade to get efficiencies and we bring the bottom line down in terms of the dollar cost per unit. Meanwhile, we have local farmers bulldozing their apple trees into the ground and closing down dairy farms that have been there for 100 years, all, the, all in this great big search for GDP growth across the global economy so that we can get greater, fit, greater efficiencies. The question is, why do we need to get greater efficiencies? For what purpose? Whereas from an Aboriginal perspective, it's always about effectiveness in a, in a Western parlance. Effective means doing the right things. Efficiency means doing things right. Well, you can do things right, but if you do things right, but they're for the wrong reason, then people die. And this is where the Western world gets it all wrong. It's focused on productivity, efficiency, uh, working harder. We know we have to work to earn an income in the Western world, so that's okay. But you've got to ask yourself, why is stress the norm? Why is the research telling us that over 50% of staff go home stressed from the workplace and people place great value on saying, I'm so stressed and I'm working harder than ever. It's become this badge of honour rather than a, a, a badge of review to say, I need to have to think about this because there's other things I need to do with my life. Which is why the term midlife crisis is such an important term to embrace rather than, rather than look down upon. Because if you're having a midlife crisis, it means you have, you've had an awakening to say, what's this all about? And our children should be growing up thinking not so much what's this all about, but having an understanding holistically of what a good life means. Our, our people prepared our young ones with holistic learning so that they had mind, body and spirit under, under, under control in terms of the knowledge systems by the time they went through law or were initiated. And so they understood ceremony, they understood mental health practice, they understood mindfulness as well as how to hunt and gather food by the time they were 12. And so stress was pretty much an unheard of thing in Aboriginal society because we had so many mechanisms of support. Whereas now when you look at the research, we've got more youth lost than ever. We've got youth suicide. We've got elder, we've got middle-aged and elderly people in crisis in terms of self-medication with gambling, drugs and alcohol. So that's not everybody, but if you look at society as a whole, it's not a a garden that germinates and nurtures well-being. It's a garden that germinates and nurtures unwell-being, but every now and then, rather than weeds, you get people coming through that are well, despite what the garden provides, because a plant can only grow in soil that is productive, but the capitalist world soil isn't that productive, if you look at it from an Aboriginal perspective. But there are good things that can be harvested. As I said, the medical system and medicines and transportation and communication and and, and entertainment and, and movies. I mean, there's lots of wonderful things, but it's about saying, how do we bring these good things into alignment with traditional values so that everybody is able to harvest a life of well-being rather than find well-being almost accidentally through the School of Art Knox. Mm. And um, you you spoke a little bit about stress in in the workplace, and obviously you've worked with clients like um, s some large clients like um, the Madison Financial Group and Commonwealth Bank um, with yep. Gone Bush. What's um, what's the experience been for you of of sharing Aboriginal wisdom in in that context in in those sessions? Yeah, very. The Commonwealth Bank Group was very hard to see what response I was getting. John told me it was quite a good response. The The, the body language wasn't that engaging mm. when I was there, and that could be several reasons. It could have been me. It could have been what was happening outside of me. It could have been the day, or it could have been the organisational culture of those people where they're not very expressive. So I, I, I found that one a hard one to read, but John tells me that they got quite a bit out of it. But certainly the Madison Financial Group 
I got feedback from the CEO because because I was there that night for drinks and people loosened up a bit and there was quite positive feedback to the CEO and also people were coming up to me and talking to me and people are usually first of all first of all when they hear me speak they're surprised because they don't know what to expect because they know nothing about culture and certainly there aren't people that have had my privileged experience of Western world uh, career opportunity plus Western world knowledge and qualifications plus Aboriginal world knowledge and qualifications. So when I present, I take a lot of effort to try and present in a way that targets an audience that makes them feel part of what I'm talking about and not judged so that they can actually harvest what I'm saying in a way that doesn't require them to change their lives or become a cult or convert, you know, things like that. So I found Madison were quite good. I've got far bigger clients. I mean, one of my big clients is um, Department of Communities and Justice, and mm. they've got about 18,000 staff. And I've got an even bigger client in South Wales Health. They've got 170,000 staff. Now, I don't talk to all of them, but I, I do talk to thousands of people. And if people are open, and most people are, people are open to listening, they usually get a lot out of what I have to say. And they're pleasantly surprised because, again, what it's about is people selecting parts of, of whatever I have to say that suits their context. Because part of Aboriginal culture is that we, we're very much focused on harvesting and uniting. So Aboriginal culture doesn't say there's only one way to do anything. As you travel country, you might find there are five different stories on how the earth came to be the mother, but you'll find they're very similar, but they, they're also different. From a Western world perspective of education and scientific methodology, an individual would say, well, you can't have five stories about this, the, the same thing. That just can't be true. So which one's right? And an Aboriginal elder would say, well, no, they're all true. And a scientific Western world person will say, but they can't be. But an Aboriginal person will say, yes, they can. Mm -hmm. That's a different way of seeing the world. And so that's why with Aboriginal people, if there's a good story or a, a good scripture from other spiritualities, Aboriginal people will say, yeah, yeah, that, that's good. And so there are, there are ceremonial people up in, in parts of Australia, very senior law people that will say, we believe in Jesus because he's a good man. He did good things. He, he told us to care for each other. He told us to love one another. He told us to care and, and support each other. So we can, we can listen to him because he's a good fellow. And we can live by those commandments because they show us good ways. So our people don't judge and say one way or the other. They're not black or white thinkers. Our, our culture says if there's something good that adds to to well-being, or we call it to the dreaming, then that's something that should be taken on board. So there's no there's no judgment. So that's why in the Northern Territory, in some communities, you'll find that they'll say the camels are sacred and shouldn't be killed because that Jesus father used to ride on that camel. And donkeys are good because donkeys carried Mary. That does a Western world lens in because I'll say, which one is it? You can't do both. You can't have a bob each way. Well, our mob at times will say, no, you can have a, you can grab a bit of everything. That's that's if it helps us. Mm. And um, are you fine? I mean, from what from what you've shared just now, I imagine there's um a combination perhaps of some of the perspectives you're sharing being perhaps quite challenging for leaders to embrace and then others of them being more accessible and obviously as you say with your background you're uniquely able to also present things to communicate things yeah. in a way that that is going to resonate yeah so i i guess um have you fr from the feedback you've received have you found these you the Aboriginal perspectives that you share really resonating with leaders? I don't know about leaders because the audiences I have, unfortunately, an observation I've made in a lot of corporate, and I've been in a lot of corporate environments with my consultancy. I've, my consultancy is about six years old and I've had over 100 clients and I've been in big government agencies. I've been with corporates and I've been with non-government orgs. So I've been through the three major kinds of orgs in Australian corporate landscape. My observation is that 
I, a lot of my audience are operational people and some supervisory middle management people that are more interested in what can they gain from an operational perspective in terms mm. of what they're trying to achieve. I very rarely get, exec get executive and senior leaders because it's the same old story and, and, and the operational people complain to me about it. They will say to me, we need our executive leadership people to come to this because they need to understand but the problem is they always say they're too busy and it, it's an inherent problem and also a major problem i see in all organizations is that quite often the executive leaders don't really understand but they're quite supportive because they know that it will increase outcomes for whatever reason so they are supportive in some of them are genuinely supportive some are tokenistically supportive people on the ground operationally by and large i find i i would say 80 to 90 percent of people are really on board with it they get it because they listen intently and they go yeah this makes sense what's missing is middle management quite often don't attend either and middle management are impediments because the operational operational people know what needs to be done in terms of systems policies and practices the executive say they want it done but they delegate the strategic responsibilities of policy and and, and overseeing of governance and practice to the middle managers and the middle managers are risk averse because they want to get good bottom lines and outcomes and keep deliverable deliverables to keep the executive happy because most of them are career aspirants and so the middle managers become blockers and stop good practice and so a lot of the research I do I've created all these research tools that give it evidence bases of what's happening and What's happening across the board is operationally people are getting knowledge, but they're being disenabled in terms of practice by middle management blockers. Mm. And that's a major problem. It's because executives find themselves in most instances too busy. I have one big organization that's got probably 2000 staff that I've worked with some work for in the last six months and their CEO met with me immediately and she's the only time I've ever met with a CEO that was really genuinely committed, prepared to put the time in. And because she was prepared to put the time in, she really understood what it is that needed to be done. So she was a breath of fresh air, I must say. Very unusual. And that's not uncommon in corporate Australia. You'll have the executive driving strategic outcomes and not really having the time to really understand what's going on on the ground. And that's actually contradictory to, to Aboriginal culture. Aboriginal culture states that to be a leader, it's called the six L's model that's in the book. To be a leader, first of all, you need to have law and law means knowledge. You need to have knowledge of the thing you're leading about. You need to have practical knowledge so you know what you're making decisions on, which is understanding. You need to have that first, and then after that you need to have love for what you're doing. Once you have love for what you're doing, you need to then be able to look, listen. And if you look and listen, then you'll be able to learn. And once you learn, then you can lead. And our model says you cannot be a leader if you don't have the knowledge and understanding, if you don't have the love, and if you don't sit and listen, look, and learn from your client group, then you can never lead. But when you look at the Western world, particularly our politicians, you'll find any minister of any department doesn't have the knowledge of their department because they get moved around. They don't really love, they don't have the ability to love because they haven't grown up with whatever department they're with. And they never have the time to look and listen and learn because I've worked at that level with ministers. They, they have a lot of minders that just shovel briefing papers in front of them to sign. It's the same in the corporate world. And so if you don't have the time to build the knowledge and understanding, and if you don't have the passion to love what you're doing, if you don't have the ability to look and listen and then learn, then you can't lead, which is why the capitalist world is in such a die straight, we, we have leaders who shouldn't be there. Mm. And yeah. how, how do you think, um, how do you think the Aboriginal wisdom that you share in these, in the workshops that you run and, and the talks that you give, how do you see this Aboriginal wisdom making a difference to corporations, for instance? Well, it gives them a new way to look at leadership to start with. So that model I just gave you, mm. it doesn't have to be necessarily knowledge about Aboriginal culture. What it's saying in that model 
is whatever I'm leading, I need to really go and learn all I can about that section or that directorate or that agency. What's the history of that agency? Why did it become this agency? How has it evolved? What is it really trying to achieve beyond the rhetoric? What's my knowledge base and what do I need to do to build that up about the storyline? And then if I don't really love this team or this agency, what do I need to do to embrace that? And the contra to that is if you're leading for the wrong reasons because it's a really cool position to get lots of money or I'm really powerful and influential and I'm seen on television, then you're doing everything for the wrong reason. So it's about using the concepts in a way that relates to your workplace. And so when I talk about the importance, so that's leadership. When I talk about caring for my place and all things in my place, you can actually use that into the workplace. And you can say, okay, this is my workplace, this is my place. How do I care for my place and all things in my place? Do I really care for my colleagues? Do I care for the people that work under me? Do I care for the people that work above me? Hello? Mm. Hello? Oh, can you, can you still hear me? Yeah, yeah, I've got about five minutes left and I'm, I might have about 10 minutes left and then I'll be gone. Okay, yeah, no problem. But I've probably given you enough to write a PhD. <laughs> you, you've certainly given me lots of lots of areas that I'd, I'd like to explore in a lot more depth. Yeah, <laughs> Ab absolutely. Um, and, and I, I think what I picked up from what you were sharing just now is that the Aboriginal wisdom that you're sharing relates on such a kind of, um, uh, how would I say this, on such a deep or intrinsic level that you can apply this wisdom to any area of your life. Yeah. It's about how you're operating yeah. in a way. Is that? It's, it's, it's multi-dimensional, it's multi-faceted. Mm. Our wisdom is it's, it's multi-usable. You can use it in different ways, and that's the beauty of it. When you think about our cornerstone of values are always be, always respect, love, and be humble. You think about that in terms of my life. Whenever you're upset, because I mentor over 300 men, whenever there's a problem, I take it back to respect, love, and humility. We'll find there's something going on there in terms of the individual not respecting externally or loving or, or being humble or internally not respecting themselves or being humble or loving themselves. You think about in the workplace, I need to respect, I need to be loving, I need to be humble. Now, when you research love, because I've just done it in this book, there's the romantic love, but there's also universal love and there's the, there's the demonstration of love, which is being kind. There are different kinds of love. So in the workplace, how can I be, how can I demonstrate love in a practical way? And that is by being loving, that's by being kind rather than stretch targets and judging people. And when you look at organisations in terms of corporate culture, they're driven by what's called organisational dominant culture. Organisational dominant culture at the moment, because I research all these things, organisational dominant culture is, is um, intrinsically driven by power, by hierarchy, by KPIs, by black and white thinking, and by a love of the written word. So that culture is also very deficit based. It says we must, we must improve, we must go stronger, we must go harder, we, let's have stretch targets. And so there's very, little, there's very little strength based approaches to managing organisations and or people. Even the term performance management puts people into hysterics because they're going, they've got to performance manage me. It all has a negative context because this whole thing is about competition and battle rather than nurture and reward, you look at the successful organic companies in recent times, they're very fluid, they, they flow, they're organic, they're strength based, all those kinds of things. And when you look at that, they haven't been built based on Aboriginal philosophy, but if you look at the way they're constructed, it actually echoes Aboriginal philosophy, which is flow, which is focus on the present. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with having goals for the future, but keep them fluid so that you can be flexible and responsive to whatever arises around you those kinds of things. Mm. And why do you think perspectives and values from traditional cultures are so important for our modern world today? Because they're universal truths. You look at love, respect and humility, they're as important today, if not more important than ever. 
because our people practice those things without even thinking because they were brought up with storylines that taught them to be humble, to be loving, to be respectful. And also the fourth one is to share. So you think about the way we live our lives. How can we do that? Now, if we're in a competitive market, that creates some challenges because we do like to try and keep some, some secrets up our sleeve to give us a competitive advantage. But again, you've got to question why. Why do we need to battle? And this sounds a little bit Pollyanna, but if you look at research and if you look at quotes by Gandhi, Gandhi said there should never be hunger in the world because there is plenty for everybody. The problem isn't the food resource. The problem is the distribution. It's the same with wealth. Plenty of wealth around. We're just not distributing it properly. So why do we need to compete? Why can't we just sit back and have a think about it and say, what are we really, what, what is this really all about? The competitive market really in some ways is a lazy market because it says all oh, your problem, you go and figure it out. Now, command markets don't work either. Centralist markets don't work. Like the, the communist systems don't work because you're going to try and calculate what demand is going to be required where and when by people. So I don't know what the solution is, but the competitive market, it has some positive attributes, but so do some of the other kind of economic modelling too. And there's people far smarter than me that would have these kinds of solutions if we could have the political wherewithal and leadership courage to actually embrace and think and plan and be forward thinking. Another really important component, you asked me earlier about some really great sayings from Aboriginal wisdom. The most powerful one I think is our, our people in terms of governance never made a decision about the now. Every decision made by our elders was always for the benefit of their children's 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 children. So Aboriginal people for 100,000 years always made decisions on people they would never meet in physical form. It was always about Whatever we do today, what effect will that have on our children's 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 children? And that's the big challenge for the corporate world we have now. Yeah, we've got share, we've got share markets happening. We want dividends, we want profitability, but at what cost to our children's 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 children? What are we leaving behind when you look at climate change for our children's 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 children to mop up? And there lies, there's the big question that we all need to think about in terms of what are our legacies? as human beings on this earth today. In terms of leadership, I question the definition of leadership. The definition of leadership in a Western methodology is about achieving desired outcomes through people in an effective way. From an Aboriginal perspective, leadership is about providing uh, a place, caring for my place and all things in my place for my children's 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 children. That's the Aboriginal perspective of leadership. Mm. Incredibly powerful. There you go. Thank you. Yeah.